Assalamu alaikum. This is the first lecture um, of biochemistry in the hematopoietic lymphatic system. And in this lecture, what we will be doing is we'll be talking about hemoglobin. So um, just to refresh your memories uh, in terms of hemoglobin uh, uh, lectures in the uh, introductory biochemistry course. Um, we'll talk about the same thing, <clears throat> but I'll add further information uh, regarding structure. Uh, important amino acids and we'll be talking about um, yeah, hemoglobin glycosylation and its importance in uh, diagnosing diabetes and we'll also talk about the genetics of um, hemoglobin molecule how, uh, how, how many hemoglobin molecules we have uh, how gene switching takes place and so on so let's uh, start uh, First, I just want to remind you of something. That is, the main resource for these lectures is the lecture itself. Okay, so it's whatever I say. Now, there are two uh, references that you can refer to uh, online, and I found them to be nice, simple, um, to the point, uh, nice images as well. I used uh, some of them in, in, in my lectures. Uh, so you can refer to them if you want. But you refer to them only if you don't understand something uh, I say, okay? So they are not the main resource, the lectures are. So let's start by talking about hemoproteins. If you remember, we talked about uh, proteins having non-protein groups attached to them. And these proteins are known as holoproteins. If we remove this non-protein group, then it is known as an apoprotein. Hemoproteins are holoproteins because they have a non-protein group, which is a heme, attached to them. Okay, and hemoproteins actually they belong to a large um, class of proteins with different functions. Probably the most important or most famous is the myoglobin and hemoglobin, which are involved in binding oxygen for the uh, uh sake of storing oxygen or transferring oxygen we have cytochrome p450 proteins in the liver that are very important in uh, detoxification of xeno uh, xeno molecules uh, we have also uh, heme groups being involved in the electron transfer chain transport chain i'm sorry and we have other proteins that function as sensors and heme plays a major role. So what is heme? So heme is an organic molecule. Uh, it is uh, it composed of four rings and these four rings which are designated as A, B, C and D. These rings are pyrrole rings. This is the structure of a pyrrole ring. Okay, now, so, so it is a, a, uh, a ring uh, molecule. It's a cyclic molecule overall. And it, it has um, branches that extend out of the heme molecule. Primarily, we have methyl groups, vinyl groups, and we have the charged propionate group as well but overall other than this group here the propionate overall the molecule is hydrophobic now in the center of the heme molecule we have an iron atom bound to it and this iron has six coordinates meaning that it can bind it can form six covalent bonds four of them are with the heme molecule itself and then we'll talk about the other two um, in a few minutes now this heme um, the the active form of heme um, has this iron if it has this iron attached to it in the center if we remove the heme, the molecule the precursor of heme is known as protoporphyrin 9 The hemoglobin molecule is a globular protein. Um, just like any other globular proteins, you have the hydrophilic amino acids um, um, located uh, on the outside of the protein and the hydrophobic amino acids uh, in the inside. 
except for two histidine um, residues and they're known as uh, proximal histidine and distal histidine. Now the proximal histidine is located um, on, on uh, helix or in within helix uh, F9. Now remember the, the number of helices that these proteins that, that hemoglobin contains. So you have a proximal histidine and this proximal histidine binds covalently to iron. Okay. Now you have another histidine residue on the other side of the heme molecule and it doesn't interact covalently rather it, it functions more like a gate uh, controlling what goes inside the heme molecule um, uh, like oxygen uh, allowing it to bind to get in and bind to uh, the uh, to, to the iron atom uh, forming the sixth coordinate okay so um, so these are the the two histidine molecules that are important now Hemoglobin is an allosteric protein, meaning that it has more than one structure. Um, and these two structures are known as the T state or the T form or the T structure and the R structure. T stands for taut and R stands for relaxed. Now, it is composed of multiple subunits, and this is a primary feature of allosteric proteins. That is, they have to be, they have to have a quaternary structure. Now, the alpha polypeptide. Now, now, so so we have these four polypeptides. Again, we have two alpha subunits and we have two beta subunits, and they're known as alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two. Now, the alpha polypeptide is composed of 141 amino acids. The very last one is an arginine. And the reason why I mention uh, certain amino acids, giving them numbers, is because they have functional importance. Now, the beta polypeptide is composed of 146 amino acids. The very last one is known as histidine 146. Okay. Now, um, so what happens is that oxygen binds to one of the heme molecules. Now, uh, note that each polypeptide contains a heme molecule. Okay. Now, um, oxygen binds to the first one, and that facilitates. It makes it easier for a second oxygen molecule to bind to the second heme, and that makes it even easier for the third oxygen to bind to the third heme, and so on. So there is what we call cooperativity. That is, there is positive cooperativity uh, whereby one ligand or one molecule makes it easier for a second to bind and so on. Okay. And, and this switching uh, between the two structures, the T and the R, are controlled, uh, uh, the, the switching, I'm sorry, is controlled by binding to oxygen as well as other allosteric effectors, and we will talk about these allosteric effectors later on. So the thing is now is that the, the four polypeptides interact with each other uh, in different manners. So what you have in here is an alpha and beta dimer. So you have alpha one, beta one forming a dimer, and this dimer or the interaction between the two polypeptides, the alpha and beta, uh, the interactions are basically hydrophobic interactions. Now, this dimer can interact with the other dimer, the other alpha and beta dimer, that is alpha 2, beta 2, via electrostatic interactions, as well as some hydrogen bonds as well. Okay. Now, so what happens again is that uh, it, it, it has been found that hemoglobin has two structures, a structure known as a, the T form, and the other one is known as the R form. These two structures, um, not only that they differ in the, the orientation or the three-dimensional position of amino acids, this is due to movement of the polypeptides, as a result of oxygen binding, but these two structures are also characterized by uh, oxygen affinity, different uh, binding affinity to oxygen.
with the T form having a low affinity towards oxygen and the R form having a high affinity um, towards oxygen. So if you look, this is the this is known as the oxygen saturation curve. So right here in the um, uh, x-axis, you see the different pressures or different amounts of oxygen versus the saturation of oxygen um, saturation of oxygen in, in, in hemoglobin molecule. And you can see that as the oxygen level increases, of course, there would be more oxygen bound to hemoglobin. But the point is that this binding curve or the saturation curve looks sigmoidal, which is a characteristic of allosteric proteins, just like hemoglobin meaning proteins that have more than one shape okay which is again the r structure and the t structure so what is the significance of having a sigmoidal curve right here it means that there are two structures and these two structures differ in the t form having a low affinity towards oxygen and the r form having a high affinity towards oxygen okay so these are the two structures again now so why is it that hemoglobin um, have these two structures well what happens is that you have gradual changes in the quaternary structure of hemoglobin okay starting with a little change in the structure of the heme molecule itself so remember proteins have four levels of structures the primary secondary tertiary and quaternary quaternary is the overall structure of proteins that are made of more than one polypeptide tertiary is the structure the three-dimensional structure of um, of a polypeptide and the secondary is uh, the structure of secondary structures like alpha helices which are um, enriched in the hemoglobin molecule and the primary structure is the sequence of amino acids uh, that make up this polypeptide or the order of amino acids so the idea here is that we have the heme molecule and this heme molecule in the hemoglobin molecule is actually bent the reason is that it's a hydrophobic structure and there is this repulsion between the distal hysterine that is located upward right here and the hydrophobic heme molecule. So the heme molecule is bent. Okay, It has a dome-like structure. So what happens here is that when oxygen comes in and it binds to iron right here in the middle, now this repulsion between the distal hysterine and heme is gone or it's reduced so the heme takes this flat planar shape the normal shape of a heme molecule is that it's flat or planar now when the structure of the heme molecule changes what happens is that it pulls the proximal hysterine with it so it goes upward, as you can see in here. Now, this is a little movement, actually, in the position of the uh, proximal histidine. It's about 0.4 angstrom. Okay, So this is really little movement. But what happens is that this movement affects the structure of the helix that this histidine, that this proximal histidine is part of. So the... <clears throat> the, the, the alpha helix, the structure or the position of the alpha helix also changes. This, change, this changes the tertiary structure of the polypeptide that is now bound to uh, oxygen. And that causes breakage of the electrostatic interactions between the chains, between the dimers. Okay. And this breakage of the electrostatic interactions it is what converts the t hemoglobin to an r hemoglobin low affinity hemoglobin to a high affinity hemoglobin 
So again, you have these electrostatic interactions between the two dimers. When oxygen comes in and when it binds, the number of electrostatic interactions is reduced, um, and that results in the relaxation of the hemoglobin molecule. So it becomes relaxed, and R stands for relaxed. Okay. So what does exactly happen? What are those electrostatic interactions that get broken? So what we're going to do here is zoom into the structure of the hemoglobin molecule and see exactly what happens at the molecular level. So right here, that's, that's the interface, um, uh, the, the surface of the uh, beta globin protein. Now we are going to zoom into this area right here. And you notice that there are interactions that take place, electrostatic interactions that take place. Primarily, you have this interaction between the very last histidine of the beta subunit with a lysine on the alpha 1, so this is beta 2, okay? And the interaction takes place between, um, between beta 2 and alpha 1. Similarly, you have uh, the, the same interactions taking place between alpha 2 with beta 1, okay? So it's reciprocal. Okay, so this is the very last uh, histidine right here in the beta chain, 146, and it can form two electrostatic interactions. The first electrostatic interaction is the carboxy terminus itself, the carboxyl group of the histidine residue. It forms electrostatic interactions with a lysine on the alpha-1 uh, subunit. Now the same histidine, the R group of the histidine, histidine 146, can form electrostatic interactions with aspartate 94 and this aspartate is located on the same chain so it's uh, so this is intramolecular okay because you have these interactions within the same chain you can consider this as intramolecular because you have interactions between uh, two residues on different subunits now this takes place on the surface of the hemoglobin molecule. So right here you have the, the, the last residue, the histidine 146, forming uh, electrostatic interactions again with lysine of the alpha-1 subunit and also uh, electrostatic interactions with uh, aspartate uh, 94. Now at the same time, there are electrostatic interactions also uh, taking place at the N terminus of the alpha subunit with the C terminus of the other um, alpha subunit. So the very last amino acid of the alpha polypeptide is an arginine. And this arginine, again, you have the carboxyl group and you have the R group. Now this is a possibly charged amino acid. So you have the, the possibly charged R group uh, uh, forming electrostatic interactions with different subunits uh, on, on the alpha uh, 2 subunits as well as the beta. But it also forms, uh, but, but something important is that you have the involvement of chloride ions. And these chloride ions can mediate electrostatic interactions between the arginine, the very last arginine of the alpha subunit, with the N terminus of the alpha 2 subunit as well. So we'll talk about the, the, the role of chloride ions in uh, stabilizing or in regulating the R to T and T to R switch as well. Okay, now, so note the groups, note the protonation state and the allosteric effectors. Okay, so we're talking about different allosteric effectors here. We're talking about protons and we're talking about chloride ions. Now, the, the, the point of uh, uh, protons is that you have these groups, especially histidine 146, being protonated. Okay, if it is protonated, uh, it, has, it carries a positive charge and it can form these electrostatic interactions. Now, if it is not protonated, it means that you don't have this uh, formation right here of electrostatic interactions. And we'll talk about the role of pH uh, in the uh, following lecture as well.
So you have breakage of electrostatic interactions. And, and, and uh, in the previous slide, it's not the only electrostatic interaction that is broken. Actually, there are uh, like many of these electrostatic interactions that are broken and, and modified, um, 20 or, or even more. Okay, so I'm, I'm just trying to focus on uh, certain amino acids and, and certain electrostatic interactions. So at the same time, you have uh, reformation of hydrogen bonds as well. Okay, so right here in the T state, you have the you have uh, electrostatic interactions. On, I'm sorry, hydrogen bonds forming uh, between aspartate and tyrosine. Okay. Now, what happens when oxygen binds to heme? Heme changes structure from dome-like to flat, and you have rotation of the uh, polypeptides um, along the the axis. What happens is that when these polypeptides change position, uh, the same thing happens uh, with different alpha helices and, and different parts of the protein. So this part in the beta subunit slides away from where you have these electrostatic, uh, from where you have these hydrogen bonds taking place. Okay, so you have a sliding of this uh, portion of the beta subunit, okay, and instead of forming these hydrogen bonds between aspartate and tyrosine, now we have the formation of hydrogen bonds between asparagine and aspartate. Now note the subunits, we're talking about interaction between beta 2 and alpha 1. As I said before, the same thing happens with alpha 2 and beta 1. Okay, so you have the sliding and reformation of hydrogen bonds. Now these hydrogen bonds uh, in, the, in the T state stabilize the T state. And similarly, these hydrogen bonds formed between asparagine and aspartate also stabilize the R state of the hemoglobin molecule. So having these two structures for hemoglobin um, makes huge significance uh, in the function of this hemoglobin molecule, which is important. It's important for hemoglobin to actually bind to oxygen with high affinity in lungs and release this oxygen so it would have low affinity in tissues. So th this is just an illustration for the level of oxygen in, in, uh, in, in different, um, in different um, conditions or different circumstances. So in inspired air, we have, of course, there's a lot of uh, oxygen relative to uh, carbon dioxide. Now in alveoli of lungs, uh, it's the level of oxygen is still high. It's about 104, whatever. CO2 is about 40 torr. Uh, now, as oxygen, as uh, blood leaves uh, lungs, the level of oxygen is 100 uh, torr. So this is um, uh, this is this is what, what when we say that a hemoglobin is saturated with uh, oxygen. Now, as the blood or hemoglobin once it reaches tissues now in tissues there is very low level of oxygen and high level of still high level of co2 as a result of metabolism now this causes a shift in the structure of hemoglobin from the r state in lungs to the t state in tissues so now the interaction between hemoglobin to to oxygen is low and oxygen is released so when blood leaves uh, tissues, the level of oxygen is about 40 torr, the level of CO2 is about 45, and it goes back to lungs and so on. Okay, so now, so this is the saturation curve again. We have uh, this um, low affinity, at low affinity state, the interaction is low between hemoglobin and oxygen. Um, not much um, hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen, so it's about um, at, at about uh, so in uh, during exercise about 40% of hemoglobin is saturated. Now, whereas in lungs, uh, 
the um, when it when uh, level of oxygen or pressure of oxygen is about uh, 100 torr, um, most of the hemoglobin molecule most hemoglobin molecules are saturated with oxygen. Okay, now. So I said that there is cooperativity, meaning that um, you have a hemoglobin molecule in the T state, no oxygen bound, low affinity towards oxygen. When one oxygen uh, atom binds to, um, to the first heme, it makes it easier for the, second, um, for the second ligand, the second oxygen to bind to the second heme and so on. Okay, so the more oxygen uh, atom atoms bind to hemoglobin the higher the affinity okay um, and we call this positive cooperativity because you have increasing affinity okay and this is why you have the plot looking as sigmoidal okay um, here you have the low affinity state as I said before and here you have the high affinity state here you have the T state and here you have the R state so we call oxygen a homotropic effector. Okay, why? Because it influences binding of the second oxygen molecule. Okay, so we call it homotropic. Now this is um, in, in contrast to CO2, for example, which is uh, a heterotropic effector because it's, it's different than the ligand. It's different than oxygen. So it's a heterotropic effector. Okay, and we'll talk about the role of CO2 in the next lecture. Now, this cooperativity is really important because if there is no cooperativity, the plot would look something like this, and this is hypothetical. Okay, so um, you really have to have high pressure of oxygen to saturate the uh, heme uh, prosthetic groups. And at, at atmospheric, at sea level, at atmospheric uh, uh, oxygen uh, pressure, normal uh, pressure, uh, and if, if the pressure of oxygen goes down from 100 to, let's say, 20, the amount of uh, oxygen that is released would be less than if the than the than the 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 allosteric protein, the 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 protein that uh, shows cooperativity, and this is the advantage. Of having hemoglobin as an allosteric uh, protein um, uh, and having cooperativity as well. So, how important is is the the cooperativity? How can we calculate this cooperativity? Now, a scientist called something Hill. He came up with an equation, and you don't have to you don't have to know this equation. But uh, in this equation. Um, he considered uh, the the, um, uh, the logarithm of the fraction of um, uh, hemoglobin molecule that is saturated, uh, and on the y-axis, on the x-axis, you have the logarithm of the pressure of oxygen. Now, and based on this, you get a straight line, and this straight line would have a slope, and the slope gives us an indication of of cooperativity. If there is cooperativity or not. And the degree of cooperativity and if it is positive or negative cooperativity and if you consider myoglobin which is not an anesthetic protein and it is not uh, it doesn't show cooperativity the slope is equal to 1 so whenever n is equal to 1 it means that the protein is not cooperative or it doesn't show co cooperativity that is okay so if n is equal to 1 there is no cooperativity now with the hemoglobin molecule, since we have two states, we have the high affinity state and the low affinity state, each one of them has its own slope. So in the low affinity state, the slope is equal to 1. So in the T state, there is no cooperativity. But whenever you have a switch from the T state to the R state, now the slope changes. It becomes uh, higher than 1. In fact, it's, it's very close to 3. It's about 2.8 um, or 2.6. So it's very close to 3. So that tells us that there is cooperativity. Okay. So if n is, is higher than 1, then there is cooperativity and it is in the positive direction. Now, if n is less than 1, then there is negative cooperativity. 
So note that the slope reflects the degree of cooperativity, not the number of binding sites. So it's not like if three uh, sites are saturated or bound to oxygen, uh, it means that the, the protein changes from, the, from T to R. Okay, no, rather it just gives us an, an indication, a measure of the extent of cooperativity. Now, for decades, scientists have argued about the change of structure of the hemoglobin molecule. And they came up with two models, and the same applies for other enzymes, other allocytic enzymes. So, these two models, the first one is known as the concerted model or the MWC model. Now, each letter stands for the name of the scientists who uh, participated in coming up with, with this uh, model. Now, um, in this model here, it, it just says that there that hemoglobin has two forms, okay? It's a T form and an R form, and they exist in equilibrium, okay? Now, if hemoglobin molecule is free of oxygen, it's mainly in the T state, okay? Yes, some of it can form an R state, a high affinity state, but most more probably it exists in the T state, in the low affinity state. Now, when an oxygen binds to one heme, uh, that results in a change of equilibrium. Now, note the arrows right here. It means that, yes, hemoglobin still exists in the T state, but you have more hemoglobin molecules in the R state. Now, let's say that another oxygen molecule binds to uh, a second heme. Well, note the equilibrium changes as well. So you have more and more uh, hemoglobin going from the T state to the R state. So if the third one binds, uh, the equilibrium again shifts to the R state and so on. And uh, if you have the four sites being occupied with oxygen, then hemoglobin most probably exists in the R state, not the T state. Okay, so that's what this theory tells us. Now, the second theory, the second theory is known as the sequential model or the induced fit model or the KNF model. Again, these letters uh, stand for the names of the scientists who came up with this model. Now, remember induced fit um, when we talked about it in enzymes and we said that when a ligand, a substrate binds to the active site, the, the shape of the active site changes according to uh, the, the substrate in order to fit the substrate into the active site, okay? The, the best fit of the substrate in the active site. Now, sequential means that there are not only two states for hemoglobin structure, T and R, there are intermediates, okay? So what happens here is that um, hemoglobin exists in the T state. When oxygen comes in and it binds to one of the subunits, the the shape of this subunit changes to the R uh, structure, okay? And it affects the shape of the neighboring subunits. Now, when the second one binds, um, you have the second subunit also changed in, changing to the R structure, okay? Also influencing neighboring subunits and so on. Now, note the errors as well. Okay, so you have the third one binding uh, and you have uh, the last uh, subunit changed or close, uh, something in between the T state and the R state. And when the fourth one binds, when the fourth oxygen binds, now the whole molecule now exists in the R state. So not only that you have T and R, rather you have uh, intermediate structures. So which model is right? Well, according to different experiments that scientists uh, performed, both models actually explain cooperativity very well. They fit the model. Uh, they did different experiments, and, and these experiments uh, show that both models are true. But most probably, scientists say that the MWC model explains positive cooperativity better than the sequential model. <laughs> 
okay? And it explains the change of structure of hemoglobin better than the KNF, okay? But, and, and the KNF model also works well for hemoglobin uh, structure, uh, but it works well in explaining negative cooperativity rather than positive cooperativity, but it's still uh, under debate, as I said. So let's talk about um, the different hemoglobin molecules now, because there, is n there isn't only one hemoglobin molecule. There are more forms uh, of hemoglobin molecules. And these forms appear during development. Okay, so what happens is that in the adult stage, you have hemoglobin molecule, molecule predominantly made of two alpha chains and two beta chains. But what you have in here is that actually <clears throat> during development, the hemoglobin molecules uh, change polypeptides. So in the embryonic stage, we have uh, hemoglobin made of two different polypeptides compared to the adult stage or even the fetal stage. So in the fetal stage, we have more uh, hemoglobin made of an alpha chain, two alpha chains, and another chain known as a gamma chain. Now in the adult stage, we have an increase in the expression of the beta polypeptide and a decrease in the expression of the gamma polypeptide. And we have another polypeptide known as the delta, which is not expressed highly in adults. So, and, and the expression of these polypeptides is actually different um, during developmental stages. So during the uh, embryonic stage, hemoglobin synthesis starts uh, from the yolk sac and it is made of two chains of zeta and two chains of epsilon. And this is known as HBE, where E stands for embryonic, HBE goer 1. Because in the later stages, or in the later um, days of the embryonic stage, you have now expression of the alpha as well, and you have little expression of gamma and some expression of beta. So you have different forms of hemoglobin as well. So you have HBE goer 2, which is made of alpha 2, epsilon 2. You have HBE Portland 1, which is made of uh, zeta 2, gamma 2, and you have HBE Portland 2, that is zeta 2, beta 2. So there are different forms, but mainly it's the HBE goer um, form that is that predominates in the embryonic stage. Now, in the fetal stage, what happens is that you have decrease in the expression of zeta and uh, gamma, and you have increase in the expression of alpha and gamma. So the fetal hemoglobin, also known as HBF, is composed of two alpha polypeptides and two gamma polypeptides. Now, if you look at the, the uh, uh, graph that I showed you um, earlier, the alpha polypeptide remains to be um, active or the, the alpha polypeptide uh, predominates throughout life. So uh, right before birth, now what, what happens actually, even throughout the fetal stage, you have an increase in the expression of the beta polypeptide and you have a decrease in the expression of the gamma polypeptide. So at birth, you have 60% of hemoglobin molecule being HBF, that is fetal hemoglobin, and 40% uh, is um, uh, the HBA, or the adult hemoglobin molecule. Now, but then it changes as we grow, and, it be and the fetal hemoglobin becomes only 1% in, uh, um, in adults. Now, hemog so the, the adult hemoglobin is known as HbA. And there are two forms, by the way. We have HbA1, 
which is mainly a, it's a tetramer of two alpha chains and two beta chains. That's the predominant hemoglobin. And we have HbA2. And uh, this hemoglobin is composed of two alpha chains and two delta chains. But it seems that the promoter uh, region of the uh, delta uh, gene is not very active. Now, what's important about HbA1 specifically is that it can be glycosylated specifically at a valine and this glycosylation is important so you have a glycosylated hemoglobin and it's known as HbA1c uh, or specifically HbA1c now this glycosylation of hemoglobin is important because it can be used as a marker for diabetes mellitus so diabetic patients would have higher proportion of glycosylated hemoglobin versus normal individuals. Now, there are advantages for measuring the uh, amount of glycosylated hemoglobin in blood. Now, especially for diabetes. Now, we can measure the level of glucose um, using two ways. The first way is what is known as the blood fasting glucose. So, so you would fast overnight, you don't eat for like uh, 8 hours to 12 hours, something like that. And um, and and you come in uh, next morning and you check for the glucose level under fasting conditions. And the level of glucose should be something like uh, between 90 and 120, maybe 110. Numbers keep on changing. Um, so that tells us, you know, how um, at, at the very moment how much glucose there is in your blood okay now so it tells us again at a certain moment what the how how glucose levels are controlled now if you look for glycosylated the level of glycosylated hemoglobin that is hba1c that tells us more information it tells us how glucose has been controlled during the past two to three months it tells us if a patient for example is committed uh, to uh, to taking the medication if the person is um, overeating um, sugars let's say if the medications are working or not for that particular patient so it gives us an idea of how things are have been have been uh, going the past two to three months okay so there are two ways by which um, HbA1c level can be expressed. The first is known as the DCCT units, which are expressed as percentages. Okay, and this is what is actually used in the US and in uh, Jordan as well. And we have the European system, which is new and it's known as the IFCC units, that is in uh, moles, uh, millimoles per millimoles of, of HbA1c to total moles of hemoglobin in blood so but there are limitations of the hba1c that is it doesn't capture short-term variations in blood glucose okay uh, it doesn't tell us it doesn't give us information about uh, current hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia okay it, um, or it doesn't give us uh, the impact of blood glucose variations on individuals quality of life that is at a certain moment let's say the level of glucose is is very high at a certain moment and and how this affects the person's life at that particular moment okay so this table is for you to memorize actually so normal individuals would have levels of glucose between 80 and 120 so the, that's normal individuals okay now this is looking at glycosylated hemoglobin the uh the dcct units are percentages so a person having five percent hba1c is or six percent this person would be normal what these percentages mean is that 5% of hemoglobin is glycosylated. Now, the IFCC um, uh, units mo rely more on millimole of uh, hemoglobin molecule per total, 
per mole of total hemoglobin. Okay, so again, it's it's a percentage, right? But it's more accurate than the percentages because right here you have five and six, whereas in here, but you don't have things in between, so you you can I mean, you, you wouldn't really have accurate measure for 5.5 or 5.6 but using the new digits or the new units i'm sorry uh you would have uh, more variation more indication for the uh, actual amount of the glycosylated hemoglobin so a pre-diabetic person would have high level of glucose this is fasting glucose but if you look at uh, the percentage of glycosylated hemoglobin so at seven percent and 53 millimol per mole of total hemoglobin diabetic uh, person would have eight and higher okay and really severe diabetes would have very high level of uh, glycosylated hemoglobin as well as uh, glucose fasting glucose level this is severe cases okay high risk individuals So in this section, we'll talk about the genetics of globin synthesis. This, this switch or transition from the zeta and epsilon to the alpha and gamma to the beta and delta and so on. So, so it's all about genetics, okay? So we'll talk about the genetics of globin synthesis, right? So these genes, actually exists in clusters on two different chromosomes and we have so we have two clusters we have the alpha gene cluster and it contains two genes of alpha so you have alpha 1 and alpha 2 right here you have alpha 1 and alpha 2 and you have a zeta um, gene so this cluster right here exists on chromosome 60 and we we have the beta gene cluster that contains the epsilon and we have two gamma genes and we have the delta and we have the beta and notice that the order of these genes reflects the order of expression so you have expression of the zeta and epsilon and then we have a switch to the gamma for the uh, beta gene cluster and for to the alpha in the alpha gene cluster and then to the delta and beta now note that the, these are located on two different chromosomes as well so you have this genetic switching that takes place okay from zeta to alpha and it's all timed and from epsilon to gamma again to delta and beta and this is determined really by uh, genetic factors and transcription factors and it's all timed it's all controlled Now, what's interesting as well is that premature newborns follow their gestational age. That is, um, if we have this uh, switch that takes place at birth, well, at, at, uh, uh, at the nine months, same thing with premature babies. They, they follow the same exact timing as well, which is quite interesting. So how is uh, switching done, this um, switching of, of transcription or expression of these genes from one to the other? Well, it's all controlled by a number of activators and silencers or repressors okay, at regulatory sequences. Okay. So what happens is that in the alpha gene cluster, it, can, it contains a, a region, an enhancer region known as the HS. 40, and it lies upstream, if you remember what this term means, it lies upstream of the uh, alpha gene cluster. So with DNA looping, you have proteins that bind to this enhancer, and these proteins can interact with regulatory elements that are present at the zeta uh, gene, and then they can bind different um, uh, uh, co-regulators would bind to um, regulatory proteins on the promoter region of the alpha gene and so on. So you have different expression of uh, these regulatory proteins uh, that, that take place at different stages of development. 
Now for the beta gene cluster, there is another regulatory uh, region or enhancer known as the locus control region. And this region also lies upstream of the beta gene cluster. And again, it's the same idea. You have proteins that bind to this region and then DNA loops around and can interact with proteins that, ex that bind to the promoter region or the regulatory, regulatory sequences that lie um, uh, ahead or upstream of the different genes. So in the fetal stage, you have interaction between proteins uh, on, on the LCR region with regulators or regulatory proteins uh, in, uh, that, ex that are bound or control expression of the gamma genes. And then as you see the switching from the fetal stage to the adult stage, you have the interaction between these proteins that exist on the LCR region with other proteins that bind to uh, regulatory elements of the beta gene and so on. Okay, and it's all timed again. And, and this, this timing starts with fertilization. So what happens here is that you have modification of these of, of the DNA regions by epigenetics. Remember, acetylation, methylation, and so on, as well as chromatin uh, uh, compactness or packaging. Okay, having euchromatin versus uh, heterochromatin, and so on. So the idea is that think about it in terms of treatment. Right. So uh, people with defects in the in the beta uh, gene, will, like in thalassemia, for example, beta thalassemia, what if we treat them by inducing expression of the gamma uh, gene, producing gamma polypeptide? That would solve a problem. Now, something else that I should have mentioned as well is that note that in the alpha gene cluster, by the way, we have two genes. Each chromosome contains two genes of alpha. Whereas with the beta genes cluster, we have two beta genes. 